Thanks everyone for joining us today. So for the presentation today, I'm gonna to go through, uh, it's basically gonna be a live Zoom radiology rounds. Um, we'll be going through a series of cases uh, in which I want your particip participation. Um, feel free to answer questions as we go. Um, at the end of each image set, I will also have a, a simple um, multiple choice that you can pick what do we do next with this case. Um, I have a series of uh, cases. We'll get through what we can today. If we run out of time, um, that's fine. If we run out of cases, I will do a little song and dance for you or something. Um, I think it'll be fun. So as Heidi said, I've been working with ARC for about the last 10 years in different um, formats. Um, I've always really enjoyed it and it's been fun to be part of an organization that's grown so much and is offering so much to the community. I was doing some quick um, calculations this morning actually um, over the last 10 years of working here and also working in the Twin Cities. Um, when I first started working here, we were doing um, approximately 100 to 150 radiology reports and, and reviews um, on a monthly basis for the two hospitals. Um, this year, between the three radiologists and myself, um, AER, AERC caseload and uh, also my local Twin Cities radiology consulting business, we're going to hit about 15,000 cases. So um, that really owes it all to you and your clients. And um, I appreciate your trust in us and providing services across the metro. This is a slide I have in almost all my presentations, and it's just a simple slide. And, it's, and what I like to show about it is we all are looking immediately um, up in this, uh, at the distal radius of this left side, and we can see this tremendous proliferative bone growth. It's destructive, it's proliferative, it's just in the radius, it doesn't cross the joint. Uh, we all immediately know um, this is a primary bone tumor, osteosarcoma, um, it's really simple. Um, yet at the same time, there's a thousand words about it in thrall radiology. And that's why I love imaging so much is that a simple image can immediately come to our, uh, an answer can come to us immediately without having to do a thousand words. So a picture is worth a thousand words. I also think one of the really critical things uh, besides good positioning when you're looking at radiographs is actually to your viewing environment. So Dr. Nevins and I uh, and Dr. Peters are sitting in a dark room, lots of screens around us. Um, and we're looking at all the structures really carefully. ER doctors are oftentimes in a more well-lit environment, but still they're able to pause and look at the images. And then um, surgeons are always superheroes and you know have awesome vision and they can do things on an iPhone that the rest of us can't. Um, they're also very good people, so I don't want to you know <laughs> make any of the surgeons upset. But. So every presentation you're supposed to have, walk away with three different things. Um, I was trying to think of the three things you should walk away with. I almost wanted to say, just come up with your own three things. Um, but I like the word three, the number three, and early in the presentation, because especially with abdominal radiographs, I really strongly believe in three views. So a right lateral view, a ventral dorsal view, and a left lateral view. Through the presentation today, just for space constraints and time, I, I don't have every lateral view or every ventral dorsal view for all these cases. Um, I do um, believe strongly, though, particularly when you're looking for foreign bodies or suspect uh, obstruction is a left lateral view is really critical and will displace gas into the pylorus and really show a lot of abnormalities that we might have missed on the right lateral view. So I always encourage three view radiography. In this day and age of digital radiographs and um, you're just, it's just using more electrons, a little more tech time, a little more electrons, but it's really pretty cheap to add that third view. So now we're gonna go through a series of cases. Um, as we go, feel free to type into the Q&A box what you think's going on. If you um, understand the, the case, um, I'm looking for feedback. Um, this is a pretty safe environment that we're working in here. Um, I also will have a multiple choice at the end of each one that you can say what you're gonna do next. This first patient, uh, this is Wynn. Wynn is a two-year-old golden retriever. Wynn is also my neighbor's dog. So unfortunately, I've seen Wynn more than I would like to. Um, in the hospital setting, but I love seeing when um, outside in the yard. 
So I'm going to share um, the ventral dorsal views on the right side of my screen. I'll pause on that for a, a second, and then I'm going to go to the um, lateral views. When presented with an approximately 24 to 48 hour history of vomiting, lethargy, and some abdominal discomfort with firm palpation. So have a look at the ventral dorsal view. Make your impressions. I'm going to click to the lateral view now and let me know if you want to go back to the ventral dorsal view. Here's the right lateral view. Have a look. Here's the opposite lateral view. So hopefully you're starting to form some impressions of what you're seeing, trying to make decisions. So ideally we make radiographic findings and then we try to come up with a conclusion or a diagnosis and then kind of decide where we're gonna go from there. I'll just go back briefly to the ventral dorsal view the right lateral view. And the left lateral view. I've got one more image in this set. It's a little bit more of a close up. We'll go to that next. Hopefully you're starting to formulate what you think you're going to do next with this case. There's a, from the right lateral view, a little bit more close up area of the ventral abdomen. And as we go through these cases today, I have many of the cases I have both images of the, both radiographs in the same image so we can just look at it all the same screen at once. So usually right now in an audience, I'll ask people to raise their hand or, or um, give some signal that they think, you know, that they know what's going on. Um, obviously it's a little harder in this setting. The big thing is I wanna ask, if you think you know what's going on, what should we do now? Should we do exploratory surgery, A, B, fluid serenia and hope with repeat rads, C, abdominal ultrasound if it's available, do a scope or ask a phone, phone a friend. Okay, I've got some inputs. Thank you so much, it's working, love it, okay. Now, just because I do a lot of ultrasounds doesn't mean everyone has to say do ultrasound, okay? But I appreciate the, the sharing of it. Um, okay, I've got a lot of, uh, a lot of C's. Good, it's always a good answer. Um, got some A's, okay. Thank you very much. Um, so in this case, I'm gonna go back. I would actually go on this, as much as I love ultrasound, I would go right to A, um, exploratory surgery. Um, and the reason why is when you look at this, a couple of reasons why. When you look at the focal exam here, you see this loop of bowel that was in the more ventral abdomen right here. We have a very tightly corrugated intestinal segments there. If you look very closely, this is where we, as we all say in Minnesota, get your Feeney goggles out. If you look really closely, right, um, can you see my arrow? Mm -hmm. Yeah, where I'm drawing the arrow, this is a linear forearm body going right down the lumen of this. So this is all severely plicated intestinal area. And a linear form body is not, it's only going to cause plication if it's anchored somewhere. And so when we see this, we immediately got to think what's going on in the stomach. That's the most common spot for something to be anchored. Um, and so when we go in this left lateral view, we can see there's this interluminal content, mixed opacity, looks like, looks like food, or sorry, looks like fabric or some kind of form body. And so in this case, this was a piece of fabric um, that had a long kind of linear string-like component that trailed down from this area through the descending duodenum and then became plicated through the uh, remaining portions of the duodenum. So I would go right to surgery in this particular case. Uh, okay. Okay, next case is, this is Leroy. 
Leroy came into AERC. Um, this is actually a photo of Leroy. Um, curiously enough, I noticed that in our back kennel we have, this is where the staff was putting their bags that day. Um, at this point in time, every cage is full of actually an animal. So now the staff put their stuff in a closet. So this, this was taken in the old days when ARC was a little slower. Um, so Leroy came in, cute retching, gagging, vomiting. I have one x-ray. This is the right lateral view of what everyone's supposed to take. I think we all have kind of a lot of comfort here. Um, I put this in just for, this is a classic acute abdominal thing. Um, this is the classic, what we talk about, double bubble. We see a ridge between the gas-filled structure and the right, uh, the cranial dorsal abdomen, and then the larger gas-filled body and fundus of the um, stomach. And so this is a classic acute gastric dilation of volvulus GDV. Um, if you see this, we need to do stuff immediately. Um, I think you guys all, all have seen those, and I just wanted you to, to have that in the acute abdominal talk. So classic double bubble. Okay, this must have been Leroy's cousin because this is a, another um, great Dane who presented with retching, vomiting. So we took radiographs, started the right lateral because that's what all the ER people tell us to do for um, GDVs. So we started the right lateral view and we see a very large gas-filled stomach-like structure. I have several views of um, this next patient. Her name is Willa. Um, so here's the right lateral view. And here is the ventral dorsal view and a left lateral view. So again, Willow was um, acutely vomiting, presented very similar to Leroy GDV. And so the question you have to be asking yourself, large stomach, is this a GDV or is it something else? Is it all, something else that dogs um, who eat things can get. So once again, we'll go to our multiple choice questions. Um, well, in fact, I'll go back. There's the right lateral view, gas, fluid, intestinal tract, ventral dorsal and left lateral view. There's a left lateral view of the more caudal abdomen. Willow was big enough to go on multiple plates. Okay, same choices. Let's see a lot of the same choices today. Okay, so we're in the new ones now. I see lots of. Oh, no, not yet. Oh, sorry. They have to start answering. Oh, okay. Thank you for answering. Got it. I like that some people are very honest that they want to say A, but they say first do C, do ultrasound, and then lean towards A. That's good. I've got answers across the board here. I've got some for surgery, some for abdominal ultrasound, some for scoping. I think all these are, have value and merit. Um, fluids. Okay, so on this one, I would also go with A. And the big reason is, when you go back to this left lateral view, very much like when we have this abnormal kind of tubular structure in the pyloric antral region. On the VD view, it's a little more subtle, but you can see the same thing in this area on the radiograph. And on the right lateral view, even though that's the classic GDV, and we were worried about a Great Dane, we took it. Um, the stomach position actually is quite normal. There's a lot of fluid filling the pyloric antral area and body and we can't see the foreign body. On the VD and left lateral view, you can see it clearly. There was a little more subtle, but there are a lot of abnormal stacking of small intestinal segments um, with some kind of amorphous interluminal debris um, throughout the mid-abdomen. It's kind of questionable corrugation and plagation down here. And this also was a, a linear foreign body that was anchored in the pylorus. All right. Give yourself a plus 
plus if you answered A. I would typically not recommend um, endoscopy in this case because of the concern of a extra stomach component. So if we think it's uh, any idea, any possibility of linear, we're going to go more with surgery than scoping because if we get in there with a the scope and we take the stomach component out, red's anchored in the duodenum, then we, we really can't effectively do what we're doing. Um, we had the privilege of having ultrasound available so we can do ultrasound when we, when we need to, um, but oftentimes with, with just a left lateral view, we can decide if we need to do the ultrasound versus the exploratory surgery. All right, this is Junior. Junior presented, she's a nine-year-old, lethargic, um, balmy and diarrhea for 24 hours. Both of Junior's views are on the same slide here. All right, so left lateral view and ventral dorsal view. Left lateral, we can see this is gas within the pyloric antral region. Just showing you what I'm, uh, what the benefit of the left lateral view. This is a good example as a radiologist. I'll I'll try to, in the report, I always say there's a little ventral spondylosis in the lumbar spine, even though it has no bearing whatsoever on this case. Uh, I've learned through all the years of doing teleradiology, if I don't comment on the spondylosis, um, you guys, somebody will call me about it and say, what about the spondylosis? So um, you'll see the radiology report, at least for teleradiology, is filled with a lot of every little factoid that we looked at everything, um, just to give you the confidence that we looked at everything and also to kind of short circuit you know, future questions. Always feel free to ask questions because we're not perfect and we do miss things. All right. So A, B, C, D, and E, same choices. When I'm looking out for the screen, I'm actually looking at all your answers coming across. So that's where my eyes keep diverting. Okay, I like the I like the answers. Answers are most of them are settling around uh, B or C. I think both those answers are a good idea. When I go back to these images, the striking thing that I see in these images is there's uh, some mild distension of the stomach with some gas and maybe a little bit of fluid. We're probably seeing the rugal folds up in this part of the stomach. The pylorus is fairly, looks quite empty except for some gas and maybe a little fluid on the left lateral view. And then when I see the small intestines, eventually, uh, initially they kind of grab my attention because I see all this fluid or thickening. But then I look at almost all these small intestines are very similar in diameter. There's slight variation in, in diameter thickness, but really quite similar. Even this descending colon, which is kind of thick and broad, is all fluid filled. Um, and then when I look at this view, kind of the same thing. What do I look at? This, the, the biggest structure is this descending colon coming along the left lateral view, uh, left side of the abdomen, superimposed over the kidney, uh, extending kind of somewhere in here, transverse colon, and then diffuse fluid or thickening of the small intestines. So I don't, I'm assuming fluid in this case, I guess in uh, hypothetically this could be a thickened small intestine. Uh, we have a more acute presentation of um, vomiting. I believe I told you is vomiting and diarrhea. Um, I like the fact that it has diarrhea. Most patients with diarrhea, uh, at least if it's more than one or two episodes, if, if, it pers if diarrhea persists while they're also vomiting, most of those patients are not obstructed. Um, most of those patients are going to have more diffuse disorder. We see diffuse small intestinal disease and colon uh, fluid. So at this point, um, the working diagnosis is some kind of nonspecific gastroenteritis or enterocolitis. Um, this is going to be kind of give fluids, serenia, 
uh, treat as a nonspecific gastroenteritis and see if it will improve. Um, I think abdominal ultrasound is a very reasonable thing to do, uh, especially if the patient is uh, clinically depressed, lethargic, if the diarrhea and vomiting persist. Um, some of these patients will have really severe hem hemorrhagic gastroenteritis, um, can start having some complications of ulcerations. And so if this is a patient that's not responding to typical therapy, ultrasound is a very good idea. Also lets you look at the intestinal wall thickness to see if there's actually more insidious infiltrative disease than just acute gastroenteritis. Uh, this particular patient ended up having uh, eventually some bloody diarrhea, was diagnosed with hemorrhagic gastroenteritis, uh, and, but treated successfully and medically managed. Okay, this is, um, sorry, I can't remember my name. I gotta look at my name, Sandy. Sandy is an eight-year-old and she presented vomiting, anorexic, and slightly feverish, slightly febrile. Here's a ventral dorsal view. Right lateral view. So I only have a ventral dorsal view and right lateral view for Sandy. Questions are gonna be the, we'll go back to the images. Oh, sorry, I lied, left lateral view. We have the same choices. Um, re the choices are gonna be um, exploratory surgery is A, B is fluids, C is ultrasound. Left lateral view, right lateral view. Ventral dorsal view. A lot of choices for ultrasound. It's good. Someone commented on there's something more ventral in the abdomen. Good. And yeah, always feel free to answer beyond the letter if you if you see an actual finding that you're kind of curious about. I'm happy to respond to that. Someone responding that they keep choosing C, which I, I like choosing C, but <laughs> ultrasound is always good. But I try to show you things that you could do in your clinic so you don't necessarily have to have someone like me involved. So I wasn't trying to be sly. Um, I, I had a little more information to Sandy. Um, she's a seven year old, kind of cockerish looking thing. Um, who's intact. So I don't know if that changes your viewpoint. She is a little bit of febrile. Um, she had been, she hasn't had a heat cycle for a while. So when I look at this a little more critically, particularly when I go to the right lateral view, parts of this are the bladder and parts of this are kind of an extra tubular structure back here. When you start looking at a lot of these tubular fluid filled intestinal loops that are ventral to the colon, it starts to get a little more curious why all of what seems to be the small intestines in the GI tract have gas. And then you get particularly back in the quad, caudal quadrants, like say on this right side, you start sort of seeing this tubular fluid opacity. Then you also notice that you know she has large nipples. You start, start wondering, is this an intact dog? Because um, actually initially I didn't realize she was intact. You start looking through all the information and it's like, oh boy, am I looking at a pyometra? So an ultrasound would be um, very um, useful in this setting. If you have one in your clinic, I would certainly encourage you to, to, to do an ultrasound. If you don't have an ultrasound and you continue working up with the suspicion that she may be um, a pyometra, and you start getting some really abnormal blood work, leukocytosis, feverish, if she's maybe has vaginal discharge or doesn't, um, and you don't have an ultrasound, I think it's also reasonable to consider exploratory surgery for this patient. Um, ultimately, she was ultrasounded. She had uh, really complex, obvious pyometra and had surgery. All this gas is just kind of incidental. She either has aerophagia on the way into the hospital. Uh, maybe there was a little bit of sort of a secondary um, 
ileus, um, but the primary problem was her pyometra. I haven't had an intern yet at the hospital get this one correct the first time. Okay, here's Rainey. Um, lethargic, 24 hours after a big day at the dog park. Okay, pretty common summertime history. I think this is kind of, we see these patients every day, I think this summer with all the people out spending time with their patient, with, a, with their loved dogs. So right lateral and ventral dorsal views, these are the only views I have of Rainey. So in a perfect radiology world, we would, we would have gotten the entire abdomen here. So cut a little bit of the abdomen off. She's a pretty big dog. Could have done better there. Same thing here. We kind of cut off a little bit of the cranial diaphragm. Going to have similar choices. I think we're all probably staring what's going on in the central abdomen here. What's a little confusing is what is this kind of uh, fusiform soft tissue opacity along the ventral body wall? This looks a lot like it could be a portion of the liver coming out, but we're we're beyond the the pylorus of the stomach. This is actually most consistent with the tail of the spleen we're seeing right here. So then you're trying to say where is this coming from? The position still suggests a spleen. One of the findings on this, they were kind of interesting, not, not necessarily pathognomonic, but when I was trying to figure out where the colon went, it looks like the colon continues up along the left side and then kind of truncates here and probably folds back around. So you get the real sense that the cranial, the, the, the cranial junction of the transverse and descending colon, which is normally at this level, as well as the transverse colon has been displaced caudally. So you have kind of this colonic displacement, it's kind of interesting. So we have this soft tissue opacity filling this area. So same types of choices, surgery, uh, fluids, ultrasound, scoping. Yep, I agree with the assessments that are coming on here. Generally, if it's available, I'd start with ultrasound in this case. And I have to be honest, I don't know if I would, the ultrasound for me is not necessarily identifying exactly what this mass is, because I'm pretty confident this is going to be a mass of the spleen. The question more is the, the co comorbidities or the presence of metastasis that we need to consider. So this is the kind of case you're probably seeing in your hospital, I'm assuming at least once a week they're coming in. Um, especially in summertime with the labs and the Goldens and the German Shepherds and Rottweilers. Um, some of the things that are kind of challenging here where ultrasound would be nice to know and help you guide some sampling. Um, this is the, um, it's quite popular these days to do the fast scans. And the reason to do fast scans is to look for presence of fluid. And if you look really closely in the falciform fat area, kind of ventral to the spleen, you start seeing these little wisps of like streaking fluid opacity. And this is a really subtle finding, but a really important finding for me when I'm looking for abdominal fluid. So this, these subtle areas of fluid streaking in the falciform fat are, are just really classic for a small amount of abdominal effusion. It's a little harder to tell sometimes when you're looking for like loss of cirrhosis of detail. It all looks hazy to everyone. To me, if the dog's big enough, it always looks hazy. But these little streaks are really important. On the ventral dorsal view, you can be a little more subtle, but you still get the same impression here. There's just a little bit of streakiness and haziness along the lateral parts of the abdomen. So those are things I look for. So probably the lethargy is associated with this mass is now bleeding. So this was a large splenic mass. Unfortunately, it was a hemangiosarcoma, sarcoma, and it had rupture, and that was fluid that was present. So ultrasound is very nice. Look for free fluid. Look for liver metastases. Identify the or organ of origin. Um, I always I had a friend who used to work in had a clinic in Florida and we had grown up together in Iowa and working in my dad's veterinary clinic which you know we're very pragmatic Iowans and so every time he'd send me radiographs and I'd say do an ultrasound he just crossed the word out and wrote surgery in the report because that's all he'd ever do and uh, that was pretty effective for him so don't be afraid to do surgeries if you're if you're game to try it but an ultrasound would be nice.
This is Bandit. Bandit is an 18 month old. Um, I think a boy, no, I think trying to blank. I'll have to cheat. Yep, he's a boy, Bandit. And he presented with uh, kind of four to six episodes of vomiting this morning. So acute vomiting. Otherwise, he's a pretty happy, healthy dog, much like this picture. Ventral dorsal view. Lateral view. That's not bandit. Don't worry, that wasn't bandit. This is bandit's left lateral view. So once again, this is a really nice example where there's gas in the stomach, but also fills into the pyloric antrum. If there was a foreign body here, we'd see it. This also shows the gas starting to come up and go in through the pylorus into the descending duodenum right here. So that's also very nice. At least there's nothing that we can see for sure in this initial portion of descending duodenum. This always becomes a question like, what is this structure? This is the biggest loop. But when I look at it closely, I've got gas in a large structure in the mid abdomen, which is right sided on the VD view and more central on the lateral view. It's C shaped. And this fits very nicely with gas within the cecum. Generally speaking, I always, the biggest loop in the abdomen that's filled with gas, I try to, I try very hard to make sure that it's the colon or cecum. If I cannot confirm that it's the colon or cecum, then I get very nervous that the biggest loop is going to be small intestine and it could be abnormal. So I always want to look for the colon. You always want to make sure there's just one colon. If you see things that look like feces in two separate segments or two big gas dilated loops, then you have too many colons. So descending colon, transverse colon, into ascending and gas-filled cecum. Go back to the remaining, oops. Same thing as earlier, very similar pattern, gas and fluid, but all overall the generally same diameter of intestinal segments. Abdominal detail is not the best, but it's kind of a, a thin dog with limited intra-abdominal fat to provide that contrast. The visible portions of liver, spleen, kind of kidney region and urinary bladder are okay. Urinary bladder is probably small, can hardly see it here. Skeletal structures look good. So, <laughs> I love, I'm not going to call it names, but I really love the response. Just by the look on his face, he totally ate something. <laughs> I would agree. He totally ate something, but I don't see it in the abdomen. So in the end, I called this a nonspecific gastroenteritis. Uh, this is a fluids and serenia and cross your fingers kind of deal. Um, never underestimate the value of a repeat radiograph. Uh, we didn't have to take any repeat radiographs because Bandit did fine. Um, but I, I always tell people, you know, it's cheaper than doing another ultrasound, doing an ultrasound or referral is to give some fluids. If the patient is reasonably stable, give some fluids and repeat the radiographs um, later in the day or the next morning. A lot of times that can be quite valuable. Um, this case was a pretty straightforward gastroenteritis. I just threw this in here to kind of give diversity to what we're doing. All right, this is um, Chico. Chico is an 11 month old female spade chihuahua who's vomiting for, um, it was three to four days at this point, vomiting. Still wanted to try to eat something, but vomiting. Um, I'm gonna click go here. This is a ultrasound in the mid abdomen. We're seeing right here, is a, this is the spleen for orientation. Play it again. So we're gonna have the same choices on this. I don't know how many of you have ultrasounds available in your practice, um, but this is, uh, if you have it, this is 
uh, kind of a classic use for it is to GI stuff. Um, most people are going to get ultrasounds and first start with fast scans and looking for fluid, large masses. Um, but if you have a skinny dog like Chico show up and you have it, you might as well take a look. If you see something in the mid abdomen that's an intestinal segment like this is, intestinal walls, and it's filled with all this sort of echogenic fluid stuff that moves with the peristalsis. But in the middle of the lumen, there's this hyperechoic structure with complete distal acoustic shadowing. You need to be very concerned about a foreign body obstruction. If you look on this segment, this is a normal small intestinal segment. This is the normal lumen. This is empty, scant amount of gas, but it's empty. This is a very dilated small intestinal segment with complex fluid. The hyperechoic interface in the GI tract is frequently gas. That's the most common reason for a hyperechoic interface. But there are two things about this that are really concerning for me for a foreign body rather than just a gas bubble. One is that it's black. There's complete distal acoustic shadowing below this structure. So it's complete dropout. Gas is gonna generally give you a little bit more of what's called kind of a dirty or incomplete shadowing. The other thing is this curved line, while it's against the mucosal surface uh, along this part of the wall, you start seeing this curve of the interface. Gas is gonna just stay along the intestinal wall. It's not gonna curve away. So this actually, this is a thing in the abdomen. It's not just gas following the wall. It, this st structure has its own structure, if you will. And that's what's causing this interface. So this was a foreign body. So based on this ultrasound and since I was performing the ultrasound, I told the clinician to go to exploratory surgery and remove the obstructive form body. The form body in this case, um, what, uh, that was in the mid jejunum level. Um, the form body was this unnamed green mat of stuff, um, very similar to the, the curved the appearance, is very similar to what we saw in the ultrasound. And then when they cut into it, it was this kind of dense fibrous mat of green material, some kind of chew, some type of toy. All right, so Sarah, I hope everyone's doing well. Do we have a little stretch here, mid-time stretch? Sarah is um, cavi, cavalier, uh, PUPD, hematuria, and plachyuria. These are the only images I have for Sarah, so have a look. I'm gonna see, I think I changed my choices up a little bit. Oh, no, same choices, A, B, C, D, E. So just as you're kind of formulating your thoughts and thinking about this case, I would tell you there's, I see at least two areas of interest or concern on, in the abdomen. I'm getting a lot of choices for ultrasound. I think that's very reasonable. Probably some choices I'm not giving you, like uh, urinalysis would be good. Maybe just some blood work. I didn't have the blood work when I first saw this case. So this is going to be, there are two things in this abdomen, two of which you can see in two, both these things, I oftentimes will have radiographs sent to me because people pull this up and say, what is going on? What is going on in the bladder? Will be a common response. And so the images get sent in for us to review. So there has been 
we haven't done a cysto, we haven't passed a catheter, we have not interfered with this bladder in any way. But when you look at it, it's full of gas, gas at the periphery of the bladder. When you really start looking, the gas kind of follows the periphery in such a way you kind of wonder where is that gas? Is it in the lumen or is it actually in the wall of the bladder? In this case, the gas is actually in the wall of the bladder. And the, what we're seeing through here is gas on the, on the lateral sides of the bladder. They're just showing through the urine in the bladder. So that's kind of gives this modeled appearance. Bladder is very large. Um, the second finding in this case, which is probably irrelevant relative to the bladder, is in the cranial abdomen superimposed over the liver, particularly kind of central to right side of the liver. It's also in the left side, but just the food in the stomach's um, hiding that area. This has a very distinct pattern. It's mineralization. It's really kind of like a vascular tree or arborizing. Uh, and what this is actually is mineralization throughout the biliary tree. So it's following the bile ducts. So it's intrahepatic bile duct mineralization, probably some in the gallbladder, but it's hard to figure out exactly where the gallbladder is. But extensive bile duct mineralization. That can result in some obstruction of the biliary tree, some areas of focal distension of the bile ducts, which may cause some liver enzyme elevation. Its potential it could even roll down and obstruct the common bile duct as it enters into the major duodenal papilla, the duodenum at the papilla. But oftentimes, this is a completely incidental finding. When I see these radiographs, about 75% of the time, I'd say it's a cavalier. So just without even knowing what's going on, I'd say this is a cavalier before I've even seen, um, seen the dog in person or looked at the history. For some reason, cavaliers have a very frequently have this biliary tree mineralization, often incidental. So it's just kind of a gee whiz thing, but you should be aware of it. In the bladder, this also is very distinct, this kind of gas. This is gas within the bladder wall, some within the lumen. This is called emphysematous cystitis. The most common abnormality that's associated with is diabetes. The patients with diabetes have a lot more glucose in their urine, it tends to foster in urinary tract infections, and frequently that urinary tract infection um, can actually result in bacteria that are gas producing and will start creating this um, classic um, pattern. Somebody just asked a question. I just missed it. I'm sorry. I'm not very talented. Ask again if you'd like. So what I would recommend in these cases, if it wasn't already done, many times when I have the images sent to me, the blood work is still pending, or you as a clinician, you've taken radiographs and you have blood work running at the same time. You really want to know, does this dog, is this dog hyperglycemic? Any evidence of diabetes mellitus? If you look at back at these radiographs, you can sort of make an argument that there's a mild enlargement of the liver as well. Um, so it's more than likely this patient has chronic diabetic mellitus and has a UTI, which needs medical management for treatment, but you're going to have to multifactorial treat, not just the UTI, but figure out what the underlying cause is. This is pretty rare. I'd like to say we don't see it very often, but yesterday we had two cases sent in. So um, we can see multiple in the same day. Um, I would probably say we see on a radiographic referral, we probably see half a dozen of these a year, the emphysematous cystitis. Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay, so Bella is a 10-year-old female spayed, intermittent hematuria for the last, couple, last few weeks, improved initially in antibiotics, more recently presented the ER because of multiple hours of strangeuria. So right lateral and ventral dorsal views. These will be the only views I have today, Bella.
So while I train everyone to try to look from the, the whole structures outside, in, circles, uh, liver, spleen, kidneys, whatever your pattern may be, it's really hard not to get your eyes drawn right to the bladder. I think we can see the bladder stones there. So the simple answer is that she has cystitis and urolis. Seeing lots of choices, um, similar choices here, ultrasound, surgery. Your analysis is totally fine. I think ideally, ultrasound would be a very nice procedure. Um, I think with the clinical signs, surgery is probably okay. There's a choice that I don't have on here, which I would recommend would be consider um, D, okay? All right, I'm seeing some, I'm seeing some revisions now. So this case obviously has bladder stones. We're worried about an infection. The, the more recent strangeria is concerning to me. And so you gotta really, really scrutinize these radiographs really closely. Because the concern would be, even though this is a female dog, is it possible for urethral obstruction from a mass or possible stone? I don't see anything on a lateral view other than the bladder stones. If I start really looking closely and turn on my spidey sense, I'm looking over the tail here. I start kind of wondering if there's something here, right? Superimposed over the pubic bone and midline symphysis. And this is subtle, and you may say that I'm a radiologist making up stuff, but there's a slightly ovoid to kind of almost triangular structure right here. This was the stone in her urethra. And this is what caused her strangeria. So she was obstructed. So if you can, I would pass a catheter and, re and retro pulse the stone back to the bladder and then do a cystotomy. On ultrasound, this can be done on ultrasound. It's a bit of a subtle pickup, but if you do an ultrasound, you need to look very closely at not only the bladder, but you try to follow the bladder neck into the urethra, and you'll see the urethra will be very dilated. Normally, you will not see the lumen of a urethra dilated on an ultrasound, but if you see a dilated urethral lumen, with a dog with strangeria, there's something obstructing the more distal ure urethra oftentimes in the pelvic area. So if possible, pass a catheter. Uh, it is nice to pass a catheter and actually put some contrast and take views and you'll sometimes see that stone. I realize a lot of people aren't doing that in practice these days, but that would be a, a typical contrast procedure to consider. Um, you could even do a, a vaginal urethrography where you actually fill the vaginal vault with contrast and sometimes it'll pool into the urethra and outline the stones as well. Okay, win, win again. So my neighbor's dog really likes to eat things. Vomiting for 36, 48 hours, decreased appetite. The picture's the same, but he has gotten a little older over the years. This is the last case we have today, by the way. This is a ventral dorsal view and a lateral view. You're gonna have the same choices, but I'm open for other ideas. So we have this large mineral opacity structure in the abdomen. We've got a couple different ways to go. We're getting a lot of choices, C, A, E, This is going to depend a lot on how the patient is. Is the patient uncomfortable? Is it persisting vomiting? Is there diarrhea? Um, when was vomiting? Was slightly uncomfortable with abdominal palpation? Otherwise, fairly bright and alert still. Fluid therapy was initiated when kept vomiting. One thing I always recommend when you're looking at abdominal radiographs is where's the stomach, where's the small intestine, and where's the colon? 
So right now I can see the descending colon with a small amount of gas and fecal content right through here. And then I really can't see the colon. Maybe this is transverse colon. Maybe this is fecal content. But this sure looks like it's in the colon. So I don't really want to go to surgery on a dog that's in the colon. Same time, wind's vomiting. So what's going on? Some very simple thing that you can do in the practice is get the patient back on the x-ray table, get your largest syringe, like your 60cc catheter tip syringe, get a red rubber catheter, and, in, and inject 60 to 120 to 180 mils of room air into the rectum or the colon. So pass the catheter up into the colon, um, inject gas, and then th what this will do will outline your colon. So then what you do is when you look after your colonogram, so we, we performed a pneumocolonogram on wind, filled the entire colon with gas. Now we're gonna follow the descending colon up. It flexes a little bit here, then goes into the transverse colon, and then comes over here like it's going towards that rock, and then bends back, and actually ends down in here into the cecum and ascending colon. So this is now the colon's all dilated with gas, and the stone is narrow is not in the colon. So this is actually a stone that was in the ascending duodenum, causing at least a partial obstruction, and needed surgery. So ultimately, surgery was performed, and the rock was removed. And Wynn is back in the yard, wagging his tail, looking for more things to eat. But this is a really simple thing. It involves a red rubber catheter, room air, which pretty cheap. Um, and then another set of radiographs, and you can have an answer without having to worry all night about is the patient obstructed or not? Should I do surgery or not? Should I have someone do an ultrasound or not? Should I refer it? So that's the end of my presentation today. I want to thank everyone for attending virtually. I really appreciate it. It's my first Zoom meeting. Um, I especially want to thank the radiologists at ARC who helped me with all these cases, Elizabeth Peters and John Nevins. Um, I want to thank all of you for the referring the cases and all the work we've done together over the last 10 years. I really appreciate it, the patients and the clients. And I want to thank Heidi for organizing this um, CE conference that we do on a monthly basis and, and keep pushing all the specialists to put presentations together and be interactive with the community. And without her, we'd, we, we would lack the encouragement to do this. But we all really enjoy it once we get seated here in the chair and doing the work. So thank you, Heidi. You're welcome.